I'm Margaret Gam, Head of Special Collections and Archives at the University of Iowa Libraries, and I'd like to thank you for joining us today. I would also like to acknowledge that the University of Iowa is located on the historic homelands of over 15 tribal nations. The Omaha Tribe of Nebraska and Iowa, the Ponca Tribe of Nebraska, Meskwaki, and Ho-Chunk nations continue to thrive in the state of Iowa, and we continue to acknowledge them. As an academic institution, it is our responsibility to acknowledge the sovereignty and the traditional territories of these tribal nations, the treaties that were used to remove these tribal nations, and the histories of dispossession that have allowed for the growth of this institution since 1847. To help you start your own exploration of these histories of Iowa and its people, we encourage you to take a look at the links provided in the Zoom chat or in the YouTube video description. Today's speaker is Brian Rejack, Associate Professor in the Department of English at Illinois State University. Professor Rejack earned his master's and PhD at Vanderbilt University before co-founding the Keats Letter Project. His essay collection, Keats's Negative Capability, which he co-edited with one co-founder of the Letter Project, Michael Thune, was published in 2019. He's joining us today to speak about the private press movement, an especially appropriate topic for us at Iowa, as we have a very significant collection in this area. So thank you for joining us today, Brian. Thank you for having me. It's nice to see all of you virtually here. Um, I was saying to Liz before we got started, I was actually at the University of Iowa at the end of February last year. It was like the last uh, last time I did anything in the world <laughs> before we entered the, the world we're in now. So um, I'm going to share my screen here. I've got some slides, lots of pretty books for us to look at, among other things. And before I get started here, we can do a little Where's Waldo? And you can see if you spot Keats here among the private press printers. I'm not the uh, most sophisticated Photoshop user, so you can probably find him. But uh, this is a photograph of William Morris and uh, the uh, Kelmscott Press staff from around 1893, um, early on in the, the, the press's development. And Keats there, I've, I've taken from this portrait by Joseph Severn and uh, put him next to William Morris um, in order to have him there virtually <laughs> with the uh, with Morris and the the Kelmscott staff. Uh, so, all right, I'm going to start with a comment from William Morris about John Keats's poem, La Belle Dame Sans Merci. And this is an anecdote that's often cited in accounts of uh, Keats's influence on the pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood. Morris is said to have remarked to his friend Sidney Cockerell that Keats's La Belle Dame was, quote, the germ from which all the poetry of his group, Morris's group, had sprung. The immediate context for that remark um, is not the mid-century heyday of pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood activity, but several decades later, when Morris ran the Kelmscott Press in the 1890s. And while I wouldn't claim that Keats was the germ from which all of the Kelmscott books and its descendant private, private press books sprung, Keats does leave a significant mark on the private press movement, editions of his poetry being printed by nearly all the presses typically identified as significant ones in the movement, and the movement of and the movement's treatment of Keats can also tell us something about the poet's place in literary culture at the century's end. Often pointing toward Morris's Kelmscott Press as a unifying inspiration and model, the press is affiliated with the movement and roughly demarcated, I'm talking about 1890 to 1920 or so here. Um, we can talk further about you know, the, the more expansive sense of what private press and fine printing means, but I'm mostly concerned with just that period. So the presses uh, affiliated with this movement shared a devotion to printing as an art, a devotion rooted in a broader backlash against the deleterious effects of industrialization across many realms of cultural production. 
As C.R. Ashby of the Essex House Press writes when reflecting back on, the pre on that press's 10 years uh, of operation, he and others aim to make, quote, each book not merely a book, but an artistic unit. The means and methods of producing these artistic units mattered as much as the final products themselves. For Kelmscott, these material practices were rooted in Morris's commitment to socialist politics, as well as in his affiliation with the arts and crafts movement, itself closely aligned in Morris's mind with the principles of socialism. So in this context, the Keats that we see enshrined through private press books contrasts with the typical Victorian representations of the poet as a beautiful dreamer or a pathological centralist. Instead, we see a Keats closer to the one depicted in scholarship from recent decades by Geoffrey Cox, Nicholas Rowe, and others, Keats as a poet deeply engaged in political and aesthetic radicalism. Now, that we ought to read Keats in relation to his engagement with politics, history, and materiality is not new for Romanticists at this point, but what I'm suggesting is that we didn't get there first. In other words, we can read in the private press instantiations of Keats a much earlier situating of the poet's linkage of aesthetics and politics, a reception that occurs not so much through explicit discourse about the poet as it is embodied in material practices of literary production. The first part of my argument then is simply that the private presses, the private press movement's orientation toward literary history presents us with a late Victorian version of Romanticism and of Keats in particular that complicates the typical story we tell about the solidification of romantic ideology by Victorian readers, editors, and writers. The fin de siècle Keats we typically encounter is either the hero of aestheticism, the poet whose sensual excess offers the promise of escape from six counties overhung with smoke, to borrow Morris's line from the earthly paradise, or he's the apolitical withdrawn poet that Gerard Manley Hopkins negatively views as, quote, living in mythology and fairyland, the life of a dreamer. Against that disembodied escapist aesthetic, we have what Jerome McGann calls the materialist aesthetic of the Kelmscott press. Similarly, drawing a continuity between Morris's affinities with, aesthetic with aestheticism and his socialist politics, Elizabeth Carolyn Miller argues that Kelmscott, quote, exposes and critiques the political effects of mass print culture and asserts the possibility of a break from the foreseeable future of politics and print. Morris himself downplayed his press's political significance, writing that his modest aim was simply to, quote, produce books which would have a definite claim to beauty. Yet, as Jeffrey Scoblow argues, quote, to make beautiful things for Morris is to make unalienated things, to reclaim the thingness of things, a utopian vision that owes as much to Keats as to Marx. So the vision of the private press movement more broadly presents a variant of Romanticism, and I think especially through its engagement with Keats, that rebinds politics and aesthetics precisely through the practices of printing that undergird the movement. So the question then becomes, how do we move from this page, the title page of the first edition of Keats's Endymion in 1818, to this one, the Kelmscott Keats in 1896, which begins with Endymion. And how might we read these two pages as parts of a networked history of textual engagements extending also to ourselves? So the, <clears throat> the broader point I'm making about that history is um, simply that the printing of editions like the Kelmscott presses the poems of John Keats has an effect on reception history. It's not just what people write about Keats, um, that, sorry, it's not just through what people write about Keats that his reputation continues to be shaped across the 200 years since his death. If we know how to read the medium of print, the practices informing and embedded in private press books also affect the ongoing construction of literary history around Keats or, you know, whatever figure you'd want to 
take up in this way. So perhaps what private press books share most fundamentally, since they actually differ quite widely in terms of specific um, aesthetics, is a commitment to awareness of the medium as a significant component of meaning. If you are lucky enough to spend some time perusing the famous Kelmscott Chaucer, for instance, um, you are quickly drawn into such an awareness of the medium. As McGann puts it, uh, the Kelmscott page is, quote, too thick with its own materialities. Of course, you know, the ability to read uh, a book like this is um, one of the questions that you know, people during the time raised, like, are these books that one can actually read? Uh, and with the Chaucer book, uh, it's, there are some challenging things about it. Um, however, most pages in Kelmscott books look less like Chaucer and more like this from the, uh, the Keats book again. Um, you know, the, the Chaucer one, of course, has letterpress text, uh, historiated initials, uh, engraved images, ornamental borders, but um, for most of the Kelmscott books, most of the pages look more like this. Uh, and that's true of the private press books more broadly as well. You can see a, a more minimalist aesthetic in T.J. Cobden Sanderson's Dove Doves Press books, which feature only occasional ornamental designs and which achieve their effects through their sparseness, as in these two examples, the um, title page for Adonais in the, uh, the edition of Shelley's poems and the title page of uh, uh, Milton's Paradise Lost. Um, <clears throat> or, sorry, one other example. This is the most famous example from the Doves Press, the English Bible, uh, with this uh, lovely uh, initial I for the opening of the book of Genesis. So even though this style could be said to represent a less self-conscious foregrounding of the medium itself as compared with the Kelmscott aesthetic, Cobden Sanderson's project nonetheless emphasizes in other ways the shared private press commitment to rethinking the materiality of print. We see that through the significance of the typography, the paper quality, the attention, attention to binding. Uh, Cobden Sanderson was initially a, a book binder. That's how he got into bookmaking. So that was of great importance to him. Um, and then my favorite example is the dramatic casting of the punches, matrices, and type into the Thames when the press closed. In the final uh, book published by the Doves Press, uh, Cobden Sam Sanderson included this last will and testament in which he speaks in the first person as the press itself. It says, to the bed of the River Thames, um, I, the Doves Press, bequeath the Doves Press fount of type. Um, and he did indeed do that, although he did it slowly over the course of, um, I think it's like 170 different nightly trips that he documented in his journals between August 1916 and January 1917. Um, and then, uh, actually, you may, may have heard about this a few years ago, some of this type was discovered. This guy named Robert Green, uh, who's a, a designer, um, was working on making a, a digital version of the Doves Press type. And he thought, let's go look <laughs> and see if we can find any of those bits of type that uh, Cobden Sanderson threw in the river um, more than 100 years ago now. Uh, and he hired a dive team, and they did actually find something like 140 different pieces of, um, of type. Uh, incidentally, this practice of casting type uh, into the sea when, or, or into a body of water when the, uh, the press closes seems to have been a habit among private press printers. Charles Ricketts of the Vail Press did this, um, as did Esther Pizarro of the Aranji Press. Um, so, okay. 
Uh, normally, when I when I give conference papers, I um, I will have blank slides to sort of you know divide things up, and I was gonna have blank slides here, and I thought it's kind of weird to have a shared screen with a blank slide. So this is what would be a blank normally, but I figured I'd put something on there, a nice little printer's mark from uh, Vail Press. Okay, so the private press printer's insistence on the materiality of their medium when read through engagements with Romantic era poets like Keats can be understood as a particular ideological stance towards aesthetics amidst broader Victorian era debates on this topic. The explicit politics that produce and permeate through the private press movement also offer a way of reading these books as a turn away from escapist accounts of romanticism. Particularly in, um, excuse me, in studies of second generation romantic poets like Keats and Shelley, many recent scholars have argued for an understanding of politically engaged romantic aesthetics. Uh, Jeffrey Cox, for instance, writes about the Cockney School of Poets gathered around Lee Hunt and claims that their works ought to be considered as, quote, poetry produced within a circle of writers with a communal cultural project. Nicholas Rowe makes a similar argument, writing that, quote, Keats's thinking about creative genius and ideal beauty, so often regarded as aesthetic escapism, can be seen as developments of the democratic sensibility formerly identified with Jacobin revolution in France. So we see some intimations of that sensibility, um, even in just the editorial arrangement of the Kelmscott uh, edition of Keats's poems. Um, so this edition places four of the poet's early coterie poems. Uh, the ones I have in mind here are the those four epistles uh, right before three of the, the odes. Um, these, these are early poems by Keats addressed to members of the political, politically radical, radical communal cultural project that was dubbed Cockneyism. And they're put in direct proximity to the great odes, typically understood as departures from the social world. Um, <clears throat> this was something that Victorian readers picked up on. Uh, this is not the only edition of Keats to to have that sort of arrangement. So Algernon Swinburne, writing the Encyclopedia Britannica entry for Keats in 1894, decries such juxtapositions as, quote, the chaotic mismanagement of his poems in every collected edition. And then Swinburne really goes off uh, <laughs> on a bit of a tirade. He says, the Ode to a Nightingale, one of the finest masterpieces of human work, is immediately preceded in all editions now current by some of the most vulgar and fulsome doggerel ever whimpered by a vapid and effeminate rhymester in the sickly stage of whelphood. So, Swinburne, not a fan of that uh, reading of Keats. Because for him, uh, this is a, a reminder, these, these earlier, more sort of politically radically minded poems are a reminder of aspects of Keats's career that many Victorian commentators and critics sought to repress. Um, in the Kelmscott edition, however, this functions as an assertion of the interrelation between aesthetic ideals and the political value of poetry, an assertion that the press, of course, itself supported and spread. Okay, this would be another place for a blank slide. Uh, instead, I give you a nice colophon here from the Kelmscott Keats. Okay, so my last um, sort of general point regarding the relationship between these private press books and Keats and Romanticism, um, and then I'll get us through, talk us through some some more specifics with some some additional examples. Um, but my my last broader point here is that the private press movement engenders a conception of history which gestures back to Romanticism while also looking forward to utopian possibilities. Speaking to the Society for the Protection of Ancient Buildings in 1889. Morris claimed that, quote, what romance means is the capacity for a true conception of history, a power of making the past part of the present. 
Morris stresses, however, that we not delude ourselves into believing we can completely replicate the, the past in bringing it into the present. The romance of history is valuable only with self-conscious awareness of the simultaneous distance from and connection to the past, a consciousness which makes possible intervention in the world of things. So, in this manner, the Kelmscott Press does not attempt to wholly recreate 15th century books. Rather, it recognizes continuity with the past while doing something recognizably new and modern. Take, for instance, the uh, methods that Morris employed to design the type used in the Kelmscott Press. There are all sorts of ways that this press is actually kind of technologically innovative and advanced, even though it's making these books that seem inspired by much older models of print. So <clears throat> to, to design the type for the Kelmscott Press, uh, Emery Walker took photographs of uh, Incunabula, basically, right? This particular example here is, um, I think it's a, a book by Pliny, printed in, in Venice by Nicholas Jensen in 1476. And if you look at the um, Okay, um, so the, the image on the left side here is the photograph taken by Emery Walker. Uh, using that, that photograph, Morris then makes on the right side here, the, the top left of the right side image is a tracing of, of that photograph that Morris made. That's what he used to, to basically develop his designs for, for the type. Um, so it's not this kind of, you know, wholly, uh, they're not wholly rejecting uh, modernity and modern technology, but integrating those things into this attempt to uh, engage with the past. Um, in a similar way, uh, these are, are a few of the um, ornamental initials. One of the rows is produced from the original wood engraved initials. The other row is produced from electro electrotyped copies of those. Um, basically, you know, it wasn't going to be a viable option to go with using the, of having all these different um, original wood engraved uh, letters. Instead, it'd be much easier to to have those originals and make electrotype copies. So Walker went to Morris and basically said, look, you can't tell the difference between, you know, this older, more pure method of reproduction and this new technology. So let's go with the new technology. And they did. So um, seen this way as products of modernity, but conscious of being in history, all private books are romantic in Morris's sense. The aesthetic principles embodied in the books are precisely modeled on making the past part of the present. We become what Morris calls the continuers of history, not by wholly imitating the past, but by recognizing our encounters with it as signs of historical change and contingency. So I wanna take us back to the um, Kelmscott Keats now. Um, and it opens with Endymion, Keats's famous opening lines to that poem, a thing of beauty is a joy forever, its loveliness increases, it will never pass into nothingness. What's significant about the, or what I draw your attention to with those opening lines is the way that Keats is, is thinking about um, the materiality of beauty, right? The thingness of beauty, that it, um, uh, wreathes a flowery band to bind us to the earth, spite of despondence, that some shape of beauty moves away the pall from our dark spirit. So it's very much a kind of materially based understanding of aesthetics. And I think that then gets um, sort of reimagined in this, this Kelmscott uh, version of the poem. So when we read a thing of beauty is a joy forever in this Kelmscott edition. Immediately, we can't help but think of the thing of beauty that is the Kelmscott book. The poem is repurposed to reflect on its new instantiation in the politically inflected thingness of a private press book. Um, <clears throat> furthermore, the division of that first poetic line uh, into two lines of type 
emphasizes this movement from entity to event. I'm borrowing here terms from Joanna Drucker, who uh, talks about this idea of quantum textuality. So the thing of beauty is a joy. It's both thing and emotion experienced in time. And I think we might say it is romance itself in Morris's terms, right? A power that makes the past present. The equation of thing and joy is enhanced by the visual presentation here, and it enacts the event of embodied sensuous reading with all the potential for historical self-consciousness it makes available. And as we continue down uh, and read the poem in this new strange instantiation, additional associations emerge. The thing of beauty's loveliness increases, or as the Kelmscott has it, taking some liberties with the sense by virtually eliminating spaces between the words, it's love lines sin. Uh, this is probably my favorite thing about this title page is that the, the second line of the poem, which appears as the third line of type, uh, you can read there um, as it's love lines sin, which is actually a perfect description of Keats's Endymion. Like a reviewer in 1818 could have said, this poem's love line sin, and it would have totally fit. In any case, uh, right, we get this weird kind of reimagining of the poetic line here. Um, another kind of out there way to read this, again, thanks to this typographical line break uh, that we have inserted between in and creases, um, allows us to read that line as if it's saying, it's, it's loveliness in creases. Um, and the creases here, of course, would be the folds of paper that make the book an object of beauty and that lend it a materiality which ensures that it will never pass into nothingness. Thus, as we read, we are wreathing a flowery band, one that binds us as much to the book as to the earth, or rather binds us to the earth through the book's own flowery bands, which surround the text and extend inward to yet another binding. So I think you can sort of get the kind of self-referential things that I think are, are going on in the way that the Kelmscott uh, edition presents Keats's poem here. Um, <clears throat> this is another uh, private press book. This is from the Vale Press in 1898. Uh, Keats's poems again, and the, the first volume of that starts with Endymion. There's a, a bit added here that isn't there in the Kelmscott uh, edition, which is the motto that Keats has on his original title page, the stretched meter of an antique song, which is taken from Shakespeare's Sonnet 17. In its original manifestation, the motto on Keats's title page called attention to Keats's self-aware anachronism, that he's writing this romance as you know this kind of antique song. Um, now, of course, it calls attention to the stretching of lines that the decorative private press page requires. And such stretching occurs um, not only laterally with the spacing of letters, but also vertically, as with the first half of line two. You can see a little more uh, zoomed in here. The second line, its loveliness increases, or the first part of that, right, gets divided um, into these disparate sonic metrical units. And what I think is the weirdest detail here that we have the, the three lowercase letters in increases, which gives this visual appearance that's completely at odds with the actual syllabic emphasis. Um, in any case, as with the Kelmscott example, I think the book supports, wittingly or not, Keats's awareness of the poem as a materially situated event, while also renewing the updated situation of reading as part of the private press's movement, private press movements, methods, and aims. Okay. Um, another example that I find uh, pretty pretty wonderful here is this miniature book from the Aramnyi Press in 1906. Uh, it's just La Belle Dame Sans Merci. Um, 
and they <laughs> mixed up the Roman numerals. So it's either 1906 or 1146. Can't help but think it may have been sort of intentional to signal its uh, uh, connections with medieval uh, aesthetics. Um, there's an errata slip in the back that says, you know, sorry, it should have said 1906 in Roman numerals, not 1146. In any case, this is a, a miniature book. It's this uh, very small, little, um, cute book. Um, and also, I'm wondering if anyone knows what the abbreviation at the bottom there, OBL and then 16 and that old English F symbol. Um, that's what one of the world cat descriptions says for this book. I'm guessing oblong and then 16 is like, is the F another way of writing 16 mo or something like that? Uh, I don't know what the F is doing there. Um, in any case, if anyone has any clues about that symbol and what it means in this bibliographic context, be happy to know. So, um, <clears throat> the, uh, uh, if, if you know anything about the, this poem, uh, and its textual history, you might know there are two different versions of it. It's sort of famous for having these two different versions. And this book, instead of choosing one, just says, we're going to print it twice. Uh, the two versions aren't that different. Um, so it, it's kind of odd, except in a, a an academic context where you want to know these two different editions. Um, but so there's this note that says, you know, there are these these two different texts, and they uh, follow the the second version after the first. What I love about this, though, is that it made me realize what is probably the most significant difference between these two poems is the difference between ah in the uh, initial or earliest published version and O in the later version, um, right? It seems kind of inconsequential, but I can't, when I think of La Belle Dame now, I can't think of anything other than that, um, ah and O, oh, uh, and it's thanks to this particular book, sort of drawing attention to that minor little textual difference. So there is something a little more significant about this, this book that I want to mention, which is that I think it actually engages in a really smart way with the the poem's own complex relation to historicity. So uh, when this poem is first published, it's in a, a magazine edited by Lee Hunt called The Indicator. And Lee Hunt has this long like prefatory essay talking about Keats's poem. And it's in, in Hunt's characteristic style of being sort of embarrassingly cheerful. Uh, and this is the kind of thing that drove Hunt's critics nuts. But um, he says of Keats's lines, he says, we wish Alain could have seen them, Alain Chartrier, this uh, you know medieval troubadour. Um, he would have found a troubadour air for them and sung them to La Belle Dame Agnes Sorrel, who was, however, not sans merci. Um, it's just like Hunt at his sort of most embarrassing. Uh, but there's something significant here too, right? Hunt makes this argument that he's he's defending his historicity um, where he says in the second highlighted bit, if we take real flesh and blood with us, we may throw ourselves on the facile wings of our sympathy into what age we please. It is only by trying to feel as well as to fancy through the medium of a costume that writers become mere fleshless masks and cloaks. So <clears throat> um, for, for whatever it's worth, I think Hunt's notion of historicity here, of, of that ability to bring the past into the present in this kind of lively, fleshy, material way, um, jibes pretty well with the private press movement uh, as well. And on the title page, uh, this, this little wood engraving image here looks very much like uh, some withered sedge by the side of a body of water, which is how La Belle Dame begins and ends. Um, of course, the image is meant to, it's showing where the Aronmi Press was um, at this brook in Hammersmith. Um, but it also gives this sense that, right, the book is sort of emerging from the scene of the poem, um, as well as the, uh, the poem, uh, Sorry, now I talk myself in in circles. Uh, <laughs> the 
The image here is presenting the scene of the poem's production, but also the scene of the poem itself, which takes place at this you know, side of the body of water. Let me just conclude by um, saying that, you know, the ethos promulgated by Morris and others through these turn of the century innovations in printing practices did not simply disappear once these presses stopped producing books. Um, fine printing continues and expands in a variety of contexts later into the 20th century and into the present. And I don't have any grand conclusions uh, at this point about how to make sense of that, that larger time scale or about how Keats might fit into it. But it is the case that Keats uh, nonetheless still exists in more recent um, examples of fine printing. So when I was at the University of Iowa um, back in February of last year, I got to see several examples uh, from the special collections there. And there was one in particular that, that stuck with me, this uh, uh, version of To Autumn. Um, by Solmentes Press, which is run by a guy named David Eslamont. Solmentes is an anagram of his last name, I discovered. Uh, <laughs> I mean, he says it on his website. I didn't like figure it out on my own. In any case, uh, this is, of course, a very different sort of book than the private press books I've been talking about. Um, it's right more in the realm of visual art than letterpress. But what I love about Esselmont's take on the poem is the combination of image, script, and type. He, he refers to these images as calligrams um, in his description of the book. So the private press printers were inspired by medieval manuscript production and the Incunabula era of print when books hewed more closely to manuscript models. And I think in a similar vein, this book demonstrates the way that digital technologies can enable a combining and reimagining of earlier media forms while engaging in thoughtful ways with the materiality of media. And that's similarly, I think, the core of how Keats exists in relation to private press books from the turn of the century. So with that, uh, we can now turn to questions and discussion.